Good evening all. Welcome to iFocus Online, the 352nd episode, 27th in the oculoplasty module. Today we have with us the very vibrant Dr. Mohammad Shahid Alam from Shankar Netralaya, Kolkata to speak to us on the infections and tumors of the lacrimal system. Dr. Mohammad Shahid Alam is currently the consultant and the deputy director, Department of Orbit, Oculoplasty, Reconstructive and Aesthetic Services at the Altya Birla Shankar Netralaya, Kolkata and head of academics of Shankar Netralaya, Kolkata. He received his master's in ophthalmology from the Aligarh Muslim University and has a fellowship in oculoplasty and orbit from Shankar Netralaya, Chennai, a fellow of the All India Collegium of Ophthalmology in oculoplasty subspeciality by the AIOS in 2016. He was an associate consultant in the Department of Orbit Oculoplasty Reconstructive and Aesthetic Services, Shankar Netralaya, Chennai, and an assistant professor at the Institute of Ophthalmology, Aligarh Muslim University at Aligarh. He is, by all means, an avid researcher and has published over 130 research articles in peer-reviewed journals and has also authored a few book chapters. He has presented numerous papers and delivered talks in various conferences and his area of interest is orbit, adnexal oncology and ocular trauma. We welcome you, sir. It's a pleasure to have you on this platform. Looking forward for your talk, sir. Okay, thanks, thanks, Subha, for that nice introduction. So I'll be speaking upon. So are my slides visible now? Uh, not currently, sir. Uh, can you please share your screen with the uh, PowerPoint on, sir? Is it visible yes, now? Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So just 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 a minute. Sure, sir. Okay, so I'll be speaking upon infect infections and tumors of the lacrimal system. So the topic is actually a bit worse. So I'll uh, try to keep myself as brief and to the point as possible. And you are welcome to, you know, ask any questions in between. You can, you can ask me to pause and uh, then we can, we can discuss if you, you have any queries. So then... Uh, Lacrimal system as a whole, when we talk about lacrimal system, is it constitutes both of the uh, secretory pathway and an excretory pathway. So the secretory pathway is primarily by the main lacrimal gland, which has two parts of an orbital lobe and a palpebral lobe, which is divided by the levator palpebral superioris. And the drainage pathway starts from the uh, puncta, upper and lower puncta, which they uh, then continue as uh, canaliculi, upper and lower canaliculi. Both of them join as a common canaliculus and open into the lacrimal sac. And then finally, they drain in, uh, into the inferior meter through the nasolacrimal duct. So this is in short uh, the lacrimal system, both the secretory and the excretory pathways. So talking of the lacrimal system pathologies, if uh, uh, we consider lacrimal gland and lacrimal drainage apparatus uh, separately, so there can be congenital anomalies in the form of congenital alacrimia when we talk of lacrimal gland and uh, congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction or decrosis to seal when we talk about the lacrimal drainage apparatus. So I, I'll be uh, talking upon infections and neoplasm. So just to have a look of the infections and neoplasm that can affect the lacrimal gland. So the infections and inflammations affecting the lacrimal gland can be infective dacryoadenitis, idiopathic orbital inflammation in the form of idiopathic dacryoadenitis, IgG4 orbit, uh, for orbitopathy, Jogren syndrome, sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, and rarely amyloids. Now, when we talk about uh, the neoplasms, so they can be classified into benign and malignant neoplasm, and the benign neoplasm, both the neoplasms are primarily of two categories, the epithelial and the non-epithelial variety. So in the epithelial variety, 
the benign neoplasms can be decreased to seal pleomorphic adenoma, myopithelioma, Warden's tumor, oncocytoma, cyalloblastoma. While in the case of non epithelial uh, neoplasm, they can be schwannoma, neurofibroma, lipoma, SFT, hemangioma, etc. Coming to the malignant neoplasm, the most common uh, epithelial malign malignant neoplasm is adenocystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland. Other uh, rarer varieties are adenocarcinoma, pleomorphic X carcinoma, mucopidromoid carcinoma, and then squamous cell carcinoma and sebaceous gland carcinoma. In the non epithelial variety, lymphomas are from the uh, majority of the non epithelial and malignant neoplasms of lacrimal gland. Other can be plasma cytoma and metastatic tumors. Now, coming to the lacrimal drainage apparatus path pathway, so the infections and inflammation which affect the lacrimal drainage apparatus are can be canaliculitis, dacryocystitis, resulting from primary or secondary nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Then the neoplasms, in benign neoplasms, the epithelial variety are most, most common ones are papilloma, rarely oncocytoma or cylindroma can be seen. The non-epithelial variety can be fibrocystocytoma, hemangioma, fibroma, lipoma, etc. In malignant neoplasm, the most common epithelial non, uh, malignant neoplasm of lacrimal drainage apparatus are transitional cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And in uh, the non-epithelial variety, the most common are, are lymphoproliferative uh, disorders, and which is mostly lymphoma. So just a word about lymphoma. The most common lymphoma which affects the lacrimal gland are mucosa associated lymphoid tissue uh, lymphoma that is known as maltoma or extra nodal marginal zone lymphoma or EMZL. While in case of lacrimal drainage apparatus or lacrimal sac, they are either a diffuse large B cell lymphoma or a squamous cell or a small uh, cell lymphoma. So this was in, in short, in brief, uh, an overview of the infections and in inflammations and neoplasms which can affect the lacrimal system as a whole. So now we'll be uh, taking up them all of them one by one. Of course, the the the, the common ones that we can encounter in our clinics. So dacryoadenitis. So the, as the name suggests, it is the inflammation of the lacrimal gland. So it can be unilateral or, or bilateral, can affect both children and young adults and presents with lead edema, erythema, tenderness in the area of lacrimal gland, pain, injection in the site of, of lacrimal gland area and, and the lateral lectus area. And this dacryoadenitis can be both infective and inflammatory, which is idiopathic. So infective dacryoadenitis can be viral dacryoadenitis, which is generally seen in in children and uh, is associated with uh, mumps, rubella virus, adenovirus, varicella zoster viruses. Viral dacryoadenitis is generally self-limited and uh, the patient is generally uh, treated by conservative management in the form of warm compresses and, and anti-inflammatory -in -in drugs. While bacterial uh, dacryoadenitis are, are more painful and the, the course of the disease is quite rapid as compared to the to the viral viral adenitis. The causative agent of course are Staph aureus and Streptococcus pneumoniae which are the common common one. Diagnosing a bacterial adenitis, like differentiating a bacterial adenitis from a viral adenitis, can be difficult but as I said a bacterial adenitis is much uh, more you know inflammatory and the symptoms are much more there as compared to the to the viral adenitis. The management, of course, more or less remain, remains the same. You have to uh, give bomb compresses. And if you have doubt that it's not a case of viral acroidentis, you can start the patient on systemic antibiotics. And if you suspect that there is formation of abscess, it, it needs to be to be drained. And in atypical cases, by uh, uh, imaging needs to, uh, to be done to rule out other causes. Now, coming to idiopathic dacryoadenitis, it is much more common than, than bacterial viral dacryoadenitis. So here the patient presents with pain, with a swelling in the lacrimal gland area. And uh, rarely there can be a limitation of abduction that is mostly by the mass effect of the, of the lacrimal gland in, in that area. And when we do an imaging, you see uh, uh, that the lacrimal gland is enlarged. And if it is an MRI, you can also see associated fat is trending in that area. And the management 
is uh, first line management if you uh, give the uh, put the patient on systemic steroids most of the of the patients they respond quite nicely and then if the patient is not responding or like there are uh, multiple recurrences relapses then uh, you have to uh, do a, do a biopsy to rule out whether there are any other causes or not now igg4 related disease is somewhat uh, uh, related uh, to uh, to idiopathic orbital inflammation but it's different uh, from uh, iuid in the sense that the disease process it's it's a systemic disease and the the uh, its uh, management as as far as management is concerned the uh, patients are quite refractory in some cases to steroid treatment and then as uh, compared to the idiopathic dacryoadenitis many cases of igg4 related disorder are are bilateral and then of course it's a diagnosis of, of exclusion and you uh, and if you have made the diagnosis of igg4 related orbitopathy or igg4 related lacrimal gland inflammation then you need to do a systemic workup to rule out systemic involvement like these patients can have mediastinal fibrosis can have pancreatic involvement can have liver involvement then you have to do a systemic evaluation to rule out rule out a uh, uh, systemic involvement in these cases so of course there is a diagnostic criteria for igg4 orbitopathy so uh, clinical examination as i as i said there will be enlarged lacrimal gland then you have to order a serum igg4 and which is considered to be to be positive it's more than 1.35 then on pathology there are like typical some some typical features which suggest that this patient has igg4 uh, uh, related orbitopathy patient can have lymphocytic and plasmacytic infiltration story from fibrosis and patient can have <coughs> obliterative phlebitis this obliterative phle phlebitis is quite characteristic of igg4 related disease and this is a criteria according to which you can uh, uh, the patient needs to be diagnosed as definite pro definite probable or, or possible so this is a case of uh, where you can see there is uh, like remember, clinically it's much more pronounced on the right side, but when you do imaging, you can see that bilater uh, bilaterally the lacrimal glands are, are are enlarged. And when I did a biopsy in this case, it came out uh, as uh, IgG4 orbitopathy. Patient has raised uh, serum IgG4. Of course, the systemic workup was negative. And then, as I said, management is, is steroids. If the patient don't respond to steroids, then you have to start on immunomodulators uh, like as a bioprint uh, and in some cases, debulking surgery might be be, be required. Sarcoidosis uh, is another like uh, inflammatory disorder, granulomatous inflammation, which can affect the the lacrimal like, gland. They uh, uh, the age range can be anywhere from the mid middle age uh, young patients to to older patients. And uh, these patients you cannot cannot diagnose on just on imaging. It, it the diagnosis is made on on biopsy. Where you, you will see non caseating granulomatous inflammation, and the moment you see your pathologist say that there is non caseating granuloma, then you have to uh, to to uh, rule out involvement of chest in the form of HRCT. Get a serum ACE done. Serum ACE, of course, is not not conclusive. It just says that there is there is a granuloma, but HRCT uh, will say whether there is, there is lung involvement or not, and then in you know the patient has to be uh, to be uh, to be managed. Along with a with a with a pulmonologist and the management, mostly mostly depend like uh, is mostly in the form of systemic steroids, and this is the typical granuloma uh, with giantsy without surrounding lymphocytes is known as Necker granuloma, which is seen in a case of sarcoidosis. Jogren syndrome is another pathology which can affect the lacrimal glands an autoimmune disorder. And apart from lacrimal gland uh, pathology affecting the lacrimal gland, they can also affect the mucous membrane, uh, other mucous membrane, especially the mouth. And the patient can present with dry mouth and dry eyes. These patients have aut uh, uh, autoimmune uh, antibodies against anti SSA and NSSB antibodies, which is also known as anti Rho and anti La. When you do an imaging, there will be enlarged lacrimal glands with increased fat deposition. <clears throat> Granulomatous with polyangitis, which was previously known as Wegener's granulomatosis, is another autoimmune condition which can affect the lacrimal gland. Affect it's it's uh, mostly a granulomatous inflammation along with with vas vasculitis. So uh, when your uh, pathologist suspects that uh, this patient has vasculitis, it can be a case of GPA 
then you have to order CNK and PNK to uh, confirm the diagnosis and then uh, management mostly relies on, on starting the patient on immunosuppressants in the form of steroids and immunomodulators. Kimura's disease is uh, another inflammatory pathology which can affect the leg lamellar gland, though it's a rare disorder and it uh, mostly affects the head and head and neck region in the form of subcutaneous nodules. So this is a sort of allergic disorder where a, a patient has uh, raised serum IgE and patient also has has eosinophilia. So uh, the diagnosis is of course confirmed uh, by by you know, biopsy and uh, the treatment again is steroids and uh, uh, other immunomodulators. Annual lymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia is another disorder which was previously considered to be uh, on the spectrum of of, of Kimura's disease, but now it's considered as a, uh, as a distinct uh, uh, entity and it uh, has been classified as a benign vascular neoplasm since on pathology, apart from other features of Kimura's, what you see is a typical endothelial uh, proliferations and is absent of germinal follicles, which is seen in cases of, of, of Kimura's disease. And the diagnosis is debulking surgery. You can you have to remove the mass as much as, as, as possible and start the patient on steroids. So this was in short about the infections and inflammation which can affect the lacrimal gland. Now coming to the neoplasms, the, the lacrimal gland tumors. So when you do an, a breakdown of the lacrimal gland tumors, 75% of the lacrimal gland tumors are non-epithelial and 25% are epithelial. Among the epithelial tumors, 55% are benign and 45% and uh, are, are malignant neoplasms. So among these uh, malignant neoplasms, almost 60% is constituted by adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland, while 40% is found by the other tumors like primary adenocarcinoma, mucopidomoid carcinoma and other miscellaneous tumors. So these things you have to, to remember, like in 55% uh, of the lacrimal gland tumors are benign and 45% are, are malignant. Among the malignant tumors, 60% is found by adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland. So coming to the benign tumors, so the cryops is the most common uh, benign uh, neoplasm of the lacrimal gland that you will see in your clinics. It's actually a, a, a lacrimal gland cyst, a ductal cyst, which can affect both the palpebrin and, uh, and orbital lobe. And it's typically presents as a bluish gray trans illumination uh, uh, positive cyst in the area of, of lacrimal gland. And rarely it can be, it can have super added infections. So the management is excision biopsy or marsupialization. So when you do a marsupialization, it prevents the, the recurrence of, of the cyst. And this is a typical histopathological feature. You see dilated ducts and, and, and arsini. Benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia is another uh, benign disorder which can affect benign neoplasm, which can affect the lacrimal gland. So it's on the spectrum of lymphocytic in, uh, uh, infiltrative disorders presents in the 6th to 7th decade of life and the patient presents with firm rubbery lesion in the in the lacrimal gland and, and it will appear like a, a, a both clinically and on imaging as, as, as a lymphoma. Diagnosis is only confirmed on, on histopathology. So there will be a unicentric poly, polychronal lympho. There will be like uh, uh, cells of, of all lineages will be, will be seen. So management is, is steroids and patient has to be, these patient needs, uh, they, these patients need to be on, on the regular follow-up because of these cases of BRLH, they in future un can undergo transformation to lymphoma. That's why a regular follow-up is very necessary. So as you see here, this is a case of BRLH. So as you can see here, there's enlargement of lacrimal gland and it has a nicely resolved with steroid therapy but then these patients need to be on regular follow-up because as i said there are chances of transformation to lymphoma and that's true for igg4 related disorders also so igg4 a patient who has uh, been diagnosed as igg4 uh, orbitopathy today can get converted to lymphoma tomorrow so that's why a regular follow-up is important in these cases now pleomorphic adenoma or benign mixed tumor this is the most common benign neoplasm of the lacrimal gland and it is called uh, pleomorphic because it has both epithelial and non-epithelial component in the form of mesenchymal uh, areas which are seen on histopathology. Typical age of, of presentation is close to fifth decade of life. Patient presents with slow-growing mass. 
prognosis and inferior dystopia of the globe. Most commonly, it arises from the orbital lobe. Rarely, it can also arise from the palpebral lobe of lacrimal gland. So, on imaging, there will be enlarged lacrimal gland along with bony remodeling. So, this bony uh, remodeling is important to differentiate this uh, tumor from adenoid cystic carcinoma, where you will see, you can see bony erosions and intratumoral calcification. So, this is a typical CT scan of a patient with pleomorphic adenoma of the lacrimal gland. As you can see here, this is a large uh, lacrimal gland mass and then bony remodeling in the supratemporal fossa. So, management is, is complete excision of tumor. So, this complete excision without capsular rupture is important because if you do, uh, uh, because if there is capsular rupture or the, or the tumor is not removed in total, there are chances of, of recurrences. So, these pleomorphic adenomas are notorious for recurrences and if some portion of the tumor has been left inside, they can also undergo malignant transformation in future. So, this is the typical uh, uh, gross appearance of the tumor, like uh, you will see bosselated ap uh, appear uh, appearance and uh, multiple nodular areas, you, uh, you can see it, it like it's a very well-defined mass and it, it, it comes out very easily. There are like not much of it's not adherent, uh, you know, to the to the surrounding orbital structure, and this is a typical histopathological feature. You can where you see both the epithelial uh, components in the form of cord and tubules and mesenchymal components. That's why it's called benign mixed mixed tumors. Adenoid cystic carcinoma is the most common epithelial malignant neoplasm of the lacrimal gland. So it has a bimodal uh, presentation of a first peak is seen in 30s to 40s and another peak is seen in the 60s. So there is bimodal distrib age distribution. Patient presents again with proptosis and dystopia, but the distinguishing feature here which distinguishes a patient of advanced cystic carcinoma from pleomorphic adenoma is presence of pain because these <coughs> tumors have Perineural in invasion, adenoid cystic carcinomas are <coughs> notorious for perineural invasion. So that's why these patients, they present with pain. So the moment a patient with lacrimal gland mass presents with pain, so you should suspect that this patient is uh, might be having adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland. And as I said, when you do imaging, so this imaging, you, uh, on imaging, you will see that there is bony destruction and there, there are intratumoral calcification. And the moment you have a doubt that uh, there is uh, that it's a, it's a not a case of of uh, a pleomorphic adenoma, it's it, uh, uh, or it's a, a malignant neoplasm. So you have to do a an incisional biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. And when you do an incisional biopsy, it's it's important that you do not breach the septa. So direct you directly give a subbrow incision, open the periorbiter, and directly take a mass. You don't breach the the the, the septum, which avoids spread of of of, of the tumor. Once the diagnosis is confirmed, then the patient can be uh, be managed depending upon the staging of the of the neoplasm. So this is the staging. So all like up to T3, these tumors can be very nicely, you know, they can have a complete excision of, of the mass and then followed by, by radiotherapy. Beyond that, complete excision is, is not possible. And then the, you know, the, the man management becomes, you know, debatable. So... Studies have, have proved that excentration per se doesn't have, you know, any additional benefit over, over complete excision of tumor with, with radiotherapy. And nowadays, uh, certain groups have come with, with uh, uh, certain protocols for management or for uh, advanced cystic carcinoma of, of lacrimal gland, where they have, uh, have, have advocated giving treating patients with new adjuvant tumor therapy, then, then uh, reducing the size of the tumor, then completely excising it, then giving radiotherapy and adjuvant chemotherapy. And the, the studies have shown that they improve the uh, survival rate and decrease the recurrences. However, however these advanced carcinoma are quite notorious for recurrences and distinct metastasis even years altogether after being removed. So uh, this is one tumor which is like you know a real challenge for all ocular plastic surgeons to manage. And this is the histopathological variety that uh, you can come across. The Swiss cheese variant, which has been said to have a better prognosis, 
bacilloid variant which has a poorer prognosis and this is the typical histopathological appearance of the uh, Swiss cheese variety of advanced history carcinoma of, of lacrimal gland. So I've already talked about the treatment. Treatment is excision or plus radiotherapy and ex exemplation if, if you know the tumor is quite large or, the, or there is uh, uh, or recurrences and in uh, consult with the, with, the, with the head and neck oncologist if it has been decided that the patient needs exemplation and of course the patient has to be exemplated. Lacrimal gland lymphoma. So lacrimal gland lymphoma. Lymphomas overall are the most common malignant orbital neoplasm, whether it is uh, arising from the lacrimal gland or any other orbital structure. In lacrimal gland, there are the most they are the most common non-epithelial malignancy of uh, uh, malignancy. And in generally, in general, they present a few decades later than epithelial malignancy, like their age of presentation will be in 60s and, and 70s. So the typical imaging feature will be enlarged lacrimal gland and these, the mass will mold along the globe or the surrounding structure as you see here. So on imaging, you can have a doubt, you can make a diagnosis, provisional diagnosis of lymphoma, then you have to confirm the diagnosis by doing a biopsy. As I told, the most common varieties are maltoma and EMZL. Then the patient has to be referred to a radiation oncologist where they do a systemic evaluation, they do a PET scan, and the patient is then treated with either radiotherapy or chemotherapy with radiotherapy. So this was in short about lacrimal gland lymphoma. <laughs> so now, there are a few pathologies which can get be confused as 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 lacrimal gland pathologies, but they are not as such the lacrimal gland pathologies. Like as you see here, there is a mass in the lacrimal gland area here. So anybody can 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 say like what 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 is this mass? Any idea? Subhav, Ruju. So possibly dermoid cyst. Dermoid cyst so. Yeah, so it's a it's a dermoid cyst arising from the frontozygomatic okay. suture or supratemporal area. So so these pathology, these patho this can be sometimes be confused as the lacrimal gland pathology. When you do an imaging, then it can be confirmed that it's it's not a like arising from the lacrimal gland. So this is another pathology, a mass arising from the supratemporal area. What is this? Ah, it's a typical yeah. fat collapse as you can see the typical yellowish appearance of the fat and so it's a fat prolapse and this one Dermal again a mass in the supratemporal region the yeah it's a lipodermoid so a fat prolapse as you see the you can see the change in the color it's quite yellowish the fat prolapse and here this one is, is a bit paler and then fat prolapse generally you know it the uh, the superior fornix is spared and it hangs down in the effect of gravity while a lipodermoid it extends from the superior fornix to the inferior fornix now this young lady present with bilaterally you know fullness in the lacrimal gland area so yeah this is <coughs> this is uh, from the lacrimal gland but it's it is not a pathology so it's a lacrimal. prolapsed lacrimal gland. Prolapsed lacrimal gland. So in this, this is not a, a pathology, of course. It's because of the weakening of the septum. So in these cases, what we need to do is make an incision and put back the lacrimal gland and take a suture through the through the gland and pass it through the periosteum. So we have to reposition the lacrimal gland. So these are a few of the pathologies that can be confused as a lacrimal gland mass, but they are not arising from the lacrimal gland as such, or they are not a lacrimal gland mass. <laughs> now, so, so that was in short about the inflammation, infections, and neoplasms, which can affect the, the lacrimal gland. Of course, I have taken the, the common neoplasms that you will routinely encounter, not the rarer, not the rarer pathologies. Now coming to lacrimal drainage pathway pathologies. So starting from the infections to the uh, when you start from the puncta and the canaliculus so canaliculitis is one of the infections that can affect the lacrimal drainage apparatus patient presents with epiphora and 
chronic discharge will be there and redness. So these patients are, you know, misdiagnosed for years altogether. And the Harrison's textbook of medicine says that canaliculitis is the most misdiagnosed disease. Overall, it's the most misdiagnosed disease. So I have seen many patients who have been diagnosed and being treated as allergic conjunctivitis, viral conjunctivitis over years altogether. And the patient doesn't have, you know, any, any response to any sort of, of medication. So what all you need to do is just evert the puncta and see what you when you when the moment you evert the puncta, you will see that <clears throat> there is a discharge over the puncta. And when you give a manual pressure here, this sort of, of granuloma or discharge you know will egress out from the puncta. So that shows that that the, uh, there is presence of, of can canaliculitis. And some cases you will see pouting puncta. So as you can see in this patient. Puncta is not pouting, but there is there is collection of discharge over the puncta. But in some cases, we will see that there is typical pouting of the puncta. So as I said, this is the most misdiagnosed disease. So, so this is difficult to diagnose and this is difficult to manage also. The can canaliculitis is one of the disease. It's very difficult to treat. You keep on treating, it keeps on, on recurring. So there are like, you know, uh, a few treatment protocols that have been, have been advocated for canaliculitis in the form of warm compressors, systemic antibiotics, then fortified, topical fortified antibiotics. Then there was one, one uh, uh, treatment protocol in the form of giving antibiotic wash, in the, uh, like gentamicin wash to the canaliculus. But then patient has temporary relief and then again it comes back. So there is one surgical management in the form of canaliculotomy where you give a, a small incision over the canaliculus and then you scoop out all the contents within, within the within the canaliculi and thereby you know uh, in enhancing the effect of the antibiotics which you are prescribing and then it increases the chances of of you know complete cure so we had this paper on outcomes of canaliculotomy uh, from our institute and I, the inferior canaliculus is much more affected than, than the superior canaliculus and that's what we also found in our paper. And then in most of the cases, when you give a manual pressure, you will see concretions ex uh, expressing out from, from the puncta. So there are, they, they can be sulfur granules, which are being, you know, formed by actinomycosis, actin, which is the most common organism implicated in canalicula, can, canaliculitis, actinomyces is really, and some cases you will just see discharge. So in, in those cases, you should su suspect a staph epidermidis or other other uh, species of, of, of staph. So uh, canalic, uh, in recalcitrant cases, you can uh, 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 use canaliculotomy, the surgical uh, canal canaliculotomy to you know increase the treatment outcome of the patient then this was another management option which we tried uh, for canaliculitis patient and right now this is the management protocol at least for in our institute for all patients of canaliculitis canaliculitis so what we do we first manually express out all the the discharge and concretions which is present there like as much as possible and then we load the antibiotic we load the canaliculus with antibiotic with the same same syringing cannula which we use for routinely our for, for like lamel irrigation so this is how it is done first you have to to manually milk out the all of the of the you know concretions and discharge in the canaliculus and then ointment is loaded in the same in the syringe along with mounted with the with that with the 26 gauge cannula and then it is gently injected as so when the canaliculus gets filled, you see that the ointment will, you know, start regurgitating from the puncture. That is the end, end point of your loading. And this is on follow-up. After three days, when you press, you will see that the ointment is coming out. So with two to three injections, this uh, canaliculitis, it completely resolves. So, and in our, in our series, we found that most of these patients, they require two to four, four settings of antibiotic loading. Now coming to acute, acute dacryocystitis. So this is a very common condition which we routinely see in our uh, OPDs uh, and in emergencies, patient with, with uh, uh, nasolacrimal duct obstruction presenting with acute inflammation. So what is what is the difference between these, these two patients? 
can anybody take up this thing nisha uh, are you there oh yes sir so one is below the medial canthal tendon and one is above uh, extending no, above the no it 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 has not uh, still it has not crossed the medial canthal tendon mm -hmm. both are acute decrocystitis but then there is a difference Sorry. So, can you make out? So, uh, the uh, one on the picture on the left, sir, yeah. it is like lacrimal sac inflammation, acute dacrocystitis. Yeah. It should be a primary cause. But ah. on the other hand, in the right eye, there is displacement of the globe, possibly mm -hmm. some other orbital pathology leading to a secondary inflammation of the sac. Yeah. So, as you see here, so this is the typical acute dacrocystitis. And here you see it has quite increased in size and it appears fluctuant and you see here this yellow spot so this is a lacrimal abscess so while this is just an acute inflammation here it an abscess has formed and the moment an abscess has formed it needs to be drained so unless until you drain it your antibiotic won't function you won't work so you drain it you give a small cut drain the pus send it for for microbiology culture and you start the patient on antibiotic and then these patients if left untreated, of course, can land up in orbital cellulitis. Recently, I have a patient who had an in, in emergency, which like presented to me with huge, you know, inflammation of the sac, proptosis, and no vision, no PL. So, orbital cellulitis can, you know, affect, uh, can have uh, optic nerve uh, infiltration or compressive optic neuropathy. So, if left untreated, these patients can progress to orbital cellulitis. So, now, chronic decryocystitis. So, here also, there is swelling in the sac area here and when you press it you, you will you will have a, 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 a cystic feeling here this thing and and uh, and this is the mri where you can see a hyper intense lesion typical cystic lesion in the lacrimal sac area so this is chronic decrocystitis with mucosal formation so for these patients so there was this landmark paper by ravi thomas which was published way back in 1997 and he coined the term roplas so, uh, Titi, are you aware of, of Roplas, Titi? Yes, sir. Are you aware of Roplas? Yes, sir. So what is, can you say, what is Roplas? Can you tell? So, when we apply pressure on the lacrimal sac uh, hmm. with our small finger, we see regurgitation of either, uh, if uh, Roplas positive, then we see so, regurgitation. What does Roplas stand for? Regurgitation on pressure on the lacrimal sac. Yeah, regurgitation on pressure of lacrimal sac. So in this paper, so Ravi Thomas, you know what he said that a uh, syringing is not necessary before cataract surgery. You just do a roplas, and based on roplas, you can decide whether you can proceed with cataract surgery or not. If roplas is positive, you have to do or you have to do a sac surgery first. If roplas is negative. You can be sure that patient is having uh, a patient doesn't have a nasolacrimal lac obstruction, and then you can go ahead with cataract surgery. If your plus is positive, then there is an NLD obstruction, and you have to do a sac surgery. So of course there will be patients like uh, after, after that a recent paper had been published where they had said where like you know, they had found out many of these patients who are plus negative, they also can have nasolacrimal lac obstruction when you do a a, a syringing. So now that is a different debate, like whether you need to do syringing or not in all those cases. But yeah, so in this paper, in this landmark paper, Ravi Thomas coined the term Roplas, regurgitation on pressure of over lacrimal sac. And if Roplas is positive, you are you can say that patient is having nasolacrimal duct obstruction. Then we published this paper where we coined this term self Roplas. So self Roplas is where many of these patients, you like when they come to your OPD, you will see uh, uh, when they complain, they also complain that when they put a pressure over uh, the medial cancel area, there is, you know, egress of fluid outside. So, so that is, so if a patient give, give such a history or if a patient of watering, in a patient of watering, if you ask the patient this particular history, Okay, whether uh, any discharges or fluid comes out when you give a, a manual pressure over the medial cancel area and the patient promptly says, yes, 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 there, 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 there is uh, some fluid that comes out when I give a manual pressure, then you can be sure that patient is having nasolacrimal duct obstruction or coronary decrocystitis. So, so management, of course, like there are two managements are either a decrocystectomy or a decrocystorhinostomy. These are the different indications for 
for the city and and this year so we are not going to in, into detail of, of of all those things now this is uh, an am amnion to seal so subha any idea of what is an amnion to seal how old can be the patient from the picture titi can you guess how old can be the patient it's a newborn baby newborn you see baby, so yes. yeah lanugo hairs can be seen you know so amnionto seal is also known as dacryo seal or dacryo cysto seal the difference just is here the the fluid which is collected here is is amniotic fluid so patient is having nasolacrimal duct obstruction and because uh, because of that nasolacrimal duct obstruction amniotic fluid is, has been has collected there and that distended sac has now also compressed over the common canaliculus and there is no egress of fluid outside so everything is no it's it's like a closed cavity now so this is a dacryocysto seal or it, it's also called an amnionto seal so now this is a canaliculops so what is a canaliculops you see are you aware of canaliculops no oh, sir i'm not very sure subha so canaliculops basically is an ectasia of the canaliculus so there is a cystic swelling generally it's bluish uh, uh, in appearance so in the area of puncta or canaliculus and when you excise it so the um, on histopathology you will find the exact pathology of of a normal canaliculus so there is no inflammation there is nothing just it, it, because of the ectasia of the canaliculus just an ectasia and out pouching of the canaliculus a cyst has formed there so this term was first you know it was coined by sax and jacobi and uh, you know just like dacryop so from there they gave this this term this uh, cystic mass rising from the canaliculus they, they give this term as a canaliculops now coming to the lacrimal sac neoplasm so they can be benign or malignant sac neoplasm so the most common benign sac neoplasm can be papilloma or oncocytoma of course oncocytoma are not that common papilloma is the most common uh, lacrimal benign lacrimal sac neoplasm so they all the features of a papilloma it resembles like a a, a a malignant mass and diagnosis can only be made on on by bi on biopsy and you have to do a dct along with a lateral rhinotomy and then this papillomas are not notorious for recurrences they can have recurrences and they can also get transformed in into a malignancy so a scopus papilloma can get uh, transformed into a squamous cell carcin carcinoma so a close follow up there is is necessary in all these cases oncocytoma is also known as oxophilic uh, 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 adenoma the most common ocular site for oncocytoma is suba the most common ocular site for oncocytoma is carankel but cases of oncocytoma have also been seen in, in lacrimal sac all, of, of course all all of them like are generally in, are mostly incidental and on histopathology you will see collection of of mitochondria which is known as as burnt out or thin out uh, mitochondria and the prognosis here is is excellent as compared to papilloma so now coming to malignant sac neoplasm so diagnosing a, a malignancy of lacrimal sac is very important of course they are very rare tumor with with almost like 400 to 500 tumors reported overall in in the literature till date so they are there are that much rare but then you need to diagnose them you in clinically when a patient comes to you with a mass in the lacrimal sac area you have to have a suspicion that no this is not a normal mucosal or a chronic dacryocystitis it it looks like something else so that that i have of doubt should be there and how to, how to create that doubt like how do, how when you when you will have a doubt that no this is not a normal chronic dacryocystitis so you will see a form to hard mass in the sac area it will be extending up, up beyond the medial canthal tendon that is the most important feature because a, a malignant sac mass it erodes the mct and it it extends beyond that which is never the case with a mucosal or chronic dacryocystitis many of these patients can his give history of of bloody tears or hemolacria so mind you most of these cases of of sac neoplasm are been diagnosed as chronic dacryocystitis and they undergo you know sac surgery twice or thrice so whenever in doubt do an imaging in the form of ct mri and dcg you know and these sac malignancies they have a potential for metastasis and 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 recurrences 
malignant sac neoplasm can be either of epithelial variety or non epithelial variety in the epithelial variety the most common one are transitional cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma rarely mucopyramid carcinoma can also be seen mm -hmm. while in the non epithelial variety the most common one is is lymphoma and as i said these lymphomas are different the type is different from that is in seen in lacrimal gland lymphoma in lacrimal gland lymphoma it was multoma or, or emz cell while here it is bb cell or a small cell cell lymphoma and chances of a lymphoma being misdiagnosed as chronic chronic diagnosis is is much higher as compared to a squamous cell or transitional cell carcinoma being misdiagnosed as chronic diagnosis so this is a typical uh, this is a ct scan here you see the mass in the sac area you can see that there is a bony erosion erosion of the lamina papyracea here and this is the ct dcg so you see the dye is seen in the right nasolacrimal duct and here there is a mass which is extending up to the from the sac to nasolacrimal duct and no dye is seen okay so that that's where a uh, dacros histography comes handy in 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 cases of lacrimal sac masses and this is a, a patient this is a, was a patient from bangladesh here presented a young patient presented with a mass in the lacrimal sac area you can see it's a firm mass extending above the medial canthal tendon. CT scan shows, uh, you know, hyperdense mass. And then this patient had to undergo lateral rhinotomy with complete excision of the mass along with ENT backup. Post-operative radiotherapy was also given. And patient is right now like almost has completed five years of follow-up and is doing fine without, without recurrences. But as I said, the cramel sac malignancies, you know, they are notorious for recurrences and metastasis. So these patients should be under regular follow-up. So this was our paper, which we recently published on um, profile and management outcome of lacrimal like renal system malignancy. So you see how rare it is. So over a 24 years period, we managed to get only 14 patients, you know. So we had 14 patients of a lacrimal like cell sac malignancy over a period of 24 years. And a medial canthal mass was the most common presentations and as you see, six patients had undergone one or more diagnosis to rhinostomy surgery for presumed nasolacrimal duct obstruction in the past. So, as I said, these are liable to be misdiagnosed as chronic diagnosis. So, that was, uh, I think, all about the infections and inflammations affecting the lacrimal system. So, I'm ready to take any questions if you have. Yes, sir. We'll just uh, ask you the questions which have come up on our social media portal. So I cannot see them, Titi. Yeah, uh, I'll just ask them to you, sir. Uh, we have compiled them in one place. Can I see those questions? Can I uh -huh. stop sharing? Uh, uh yes, sir. But uh, they are not visible on the Zoom platform. They have come in from the various social media portals like Facebook or YouTube. Okay, of okay. Course. So you can you can you know you can just uh you know read out the, those questions so that I can answer. Yes, Atiti will go ahead with reading out those questions, sir. Huh? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. So the first question is, uh, sir, could you please comment upon the differential involvement of orbital versus palpebral lobe in dacroadenitis? Orbital versus pal pal palpebral lobe like dacroadenitis, the differential. Yes. Sir. Yeah. So the the differential of dacroadenitis. So as I told, it can be idiopathic inflammation or infective inflammation. So first you have to see whether it's an inflammatory lesion or a, it's a non-inflammatory lesion. So how will you differentiate whether it's an inflammatory or a non-inflammatory lesion? So presence of pain and tenderness. So that is the most important feature that will differentiate an inflammatory lesion from a non-inflammatory lesion. So the moment you see that there is no pain, no tenderness in a patient who has a lacrimal gland mass, you should not suspect the cryoidinitis in that case, and a, a you know a, a bell should ring in your in your in your mind that it, this is something else. In those cases, you should order an imaging, and more often than not, these cases can be a, of of lymphoproliferative origin. They can be either a a benign uh, reactive lymphoid hyperplasia or an uh, IgG4 orbitopathy or or lymphoma, and rarely. They can be like lacrimal gland masses, but of course, the like lacrimal gland masses, like you will see that, uh, you know, uh, there is inferior dystopia, ischiapetosis, all those cases. But a dacryoidinitis, you know, it, it can like uh, uh, mimic a lymphoma. Lymphoma can mimic a, a dacryoidinitis. 
So pain is the pain is the most important differentiating feature and other signs of inflammation that injection in that area of, of like mammal uh, gland in the area of, of lateral rectus. So all those features that you have you have to look out. Okay, sir. So proceeding with the next question, uh, yeah. can Schirmer's test be of diagnostic help in orbital versus palpebral lobe lesions? To help a certain no no not necessarily because both it's not that just you know palpebral lobe it, it you know it does uh, uh, do the most of the, the secretion but that doesn't mean the orbital lobe is of no importance understood and then when there is presence of inflammation you might see that the shamas might be increased you know there might be you know in increased uh, like rhymation so, and whether it's an orbital involvement of orbital lobe or it's in involvement of palpebral lobe, that you can see clinically and on imaging. But the management remains, of course, the same. Okay, sir. So, what is the role of CT versus MRI in lacrimal gland regions, which would be? See, so initially, like in the days when we were doing our post graduations, and if you, if you see that fifth or sixth edition of Kansky in uh, those chapter of, of uh, orbit and oculoplasty, so they have written CT scan as the imaging modality of choice for all orbital lesions. So, but then the problem with CT scan is it just shows that there is a mass. But what an MRI does, it apart from showing that there is a mass, it shows what kind of mass it is, what are the changes in the surrounding structures of the mass. So, whenever you need to, if, if to order an imaging, if you're suspecting a like primal gland mass, I would go ahead with a, an MRI rather than a CT scan. CT scan will just give you an idea of the of, of, of the bony structure, right? But then on MRI, you can get information about the bone marrow involvement. So if you're suspecting an adenocystic carcinoma, so a lacrimal gland mass with involvement of bone marrow on MRI can give you a clue that this is a case of adenocystic carcinoma. So for almost all orbital pathologies, an MRI is a better option than a CT scan. So the next question is, uh, in uh, on CT scan uh, or on MRI, if we see uh, how to differentiate exactly between bony excavation between and bony rim irregularity and how to proceed forward with our diagnosis based on this finding. See, first of all, you have to look for the mass also, okay? So, so if the mass is regular, smooth, there is no intratumoral calcification. So that gives you an idea, okay, it's a kind of a benign mass. So now if that mass shows some sort of bony remodeling on CT scan or bony excavation, then you can say that this is a pressure effect of the mass, okay? It's it's not a, 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 a malignant process that is going on. It's just because of the pressure of that thing, of that mass. But if you see that the mass is irregular, okay, and then there's there's tumoral intertumoral calcification, there's infiltration into the surrounding structure, and in that particular case, you also see that there is bony excavation or there is bony erosion. Then you you know you should suspect no, okay, this is a, a malignancy. So everything you know had, has to be seen as a whole. You know, you, you, when you see a mass, you just you don't you just don't see okay, uh, what is there, what's going on in the bone. You also first see the mass, and then you see the bone, and then you see the bony surrounding structures. You see the orbit. You know. Yes, sir. Uh, so next we have uh, what is the role of canalicular expression in chronic canaliculitis, and how frequently should it be performed? Yeah. So canalicular expression, it's very important. Uh, in the management of, of canaliculitis and it should be done on each and every visit the patient comes to you. Whatever management protocol you are following, whether you are following fortified antibiotic or you are following uh, wash with, with uh, you know, gentamicin or an antibiotic ointment loading. First of all, you have to do a thorough canalicular expression honestly. Okay. So take time, you know, nicely express out as much as possible patient will have pain you have to counsel the patient also in between but then that canalicular expression has to be done thoroughly and honestly honestly means that you have to keep doing it don't be lazy okay so if you don't express it out nicely canaliculitis is not going to resolve so that is the most important step of management of canaliculitis 
coming i'm proceeding with the next question so mm-hmm. in case of actinomyces which has been detected on culture sensitivity so what is the choice of antibiotic and the duration of the course no that will depend upon your your culture and sensitivity okay sir okay so and then uh, systemic antibiotic generally doesn't have any role so you have to start the patient on topical antibiotics fortified or you do you 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 do an uh, ointment loading either with the moxifloxacin or ciprofloxacin ointment to express out the contents and do a ointment loading according to the culture and sensitivity sir are uh, multi drug resistance is it commonly uh, encountered in uh, canaliculitis and if so what can be the protocol yeah, if, if, if multi drug resistance if, if you are encountering encountering multi drug resistance then you start the patient on fortified vancomycin fortified ciprofloxacin yeah give a wash okay sir uh, sir uh, coming to the next question what are the steps to prevent fistula prevent uh, formation in during evaluation of acute dacrocystitis is there any precautionary method which we can take see uh, when you whenever you are evaluating a case of acute dacrocystitis so try not to do a lacrimal sac irrigation try not to do a roplas okay because it's a uh, you know diagnosis which is written on the uh, on the face of the patient patient sits on your chair and you know that it's a yeah to dacrocystitis so don't uh, do anything uh, on that moment you know allow it to heal allow the, the inflammation to settle down and then uh, whenever when the inflammation settles down then you can you know you can do your like normal evaluation secondly uh, it you know it is being being you know uh, thought that when you do when you drain an abscess there are chances of of, of fistula formation it's not like that it's not like that Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, uh, what? Uh, how to rule out malignancy of sac masquerading as an inflammatory swelling? Is there any clinical pearls which we can? Yeah, as I said, it's very very important that you you know whenever a patient you see a patient of a, a mass in the lacrimal sac area, so always have a malignancy in the back of your mind. Is it a lacrimal sac malignancy? And then what are those clinical signs? So first of all, when you see, see the mass, see whether it is extending above the MCT or not. If it is extending above the MCT, you know, you are sure that no, it's not, not a normal mucosal or chronic dacryocystitis. Then palpate the mass. Palpate, when you palpate, so in the case of mucosal or chronic dacryocystitis, there will be doughy feeling, you know, cystic-like feeling. There will be a, a neoplasm or a papilloma will be formed too hard. Then see the sur- overlying skin. I mean, you can see like the picture which I showed. You see the overlying skin was, was you know, there was no puckering. It, it was healthy, normal and healthy. But in cases of malignancy, there will be puckering of the skin, you know. The, it will be adherent, the mass will be adherent to the overlying skin. There can be erosion of the skin also. So these are the features that will create a doubt, you know, mind. Okay, no, it's not a case of normal chronic dacrocystitis. Something wrong is going on. Yeah, and then you order an imaging. So if if whenever in doubt, do an imaging. Sir, if we encounter a lacrimal sac swelling, uh, uh, are we routinely supposed to go forward with a nasal examination? And if so, then what are we supposed to note in that case? Uh, are we routinely? I didn't get that question. Are we supposed so a nasal examination in case of lacrimal gland swellings? What are we looking for and uh, is it routinely done in each and every yeah, case? Yeah, it, it is routinely done in each and every case. So whenever you do, do you see a, a sac swelling, so either it's a, a lacrimal drainage uh, pathway obstruction or it's a mass lesion, right? So if, we, if it is a pathway obstruction, so anyways, you are planning this year, you have to do a nasal endoscopic examination before this year. That is a, a routine thing. So and in that case you have to do a, you have to see uh, the you know inferior meters also and if there is a mass you have to see whether the mass is extending into the inferior meters or not and of course that information you also get when you will do an imaging so doing a nasal uh, endoscopy nasal examination it's always a good idea yeah so what are the find what are the uh, what is the inference we draw when there is a regurgitation of air on roplas Regurgitation of air while doing syringing. So, roplas. Or roplas, huh? 
yeah so yeah i am writing a paper on it actually and i come i i have given a term to this entity lacrimo nemoresia so you know so i i'm just uh, sending this paper uh, submitting this paper so i give this term lacrimo nemoresia and it is mostly seen in patients who have undergone probing and syringing after congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction so when you do probing and syringing so some of the valvular function of this valve of Rosen, Rosenmuller and then valve of Hazard, it gets affected. And air, that air, you know, get entrapped into the sac. And when you give pressure over the sac, it comes out through the puncta. So many of the patients will also complain. Okay, when we uh, press over the punk, you know, sac area, we hear a funny sound, right? So that is actually a exit of the air. So I call it lacrimonemoragia. And it's mostly seen in cases of, of CNL. Sometimes some in some patients of DCR also you can see. But mostly after probing and syringe. Okay, so I think and there done. is an entity which is called which is very rare. And I have seen a case, uh, and it, it is called as nematocele. Like ramal site nematocele. So in those in that case, also you can hear a crepitus when you press over the site. Okay, so. So any specific uh, findings which we see when uh, in case of tubercular involvement of the lacrimal system? See, tuberculosis can involve both lacrimal gland and lacrimal sac, right? Yes. So involvement of lacrimal sac is quite rare and uh, diagnosing it is very difficult. Patient can very well go misdiagnosed unless until, you know, some, someone is very astute and while doing a DCR, he notices something wrong, like something peculiar in the sac flap, and he sends it for pathology. Otherwise, you're not going to diagnose uh, a lacrimal sac uh, tuberculosis. Some patients can have bloody tears also of lacrimal sac tuberculosis. Lacrimal gland tuberculosis, so there are like you know, four to five varieties of lacrimal gland tuberculosis. So there can be a cold abscess, there can be periostitis, you know, so there can be fistula formation and none of these cases you can diagnose without biopsy. You cannot say by seeing these patients, by seeing the imaging patient as lacrimal gland tuberculosis. You have to do a biopsy. The pathologist will see that there is caseating necrosis being seen or granuloma seen and you have to rule out tuberculosis and many of these patients will have to undergo PCR also on that specimen that you have taken. PCR for mycobacterium tuberculosis to diagnose tuberculosis. And once you have made a diagnosis of lacrimal gland tuberculosis, patient has to follow that ATT protocol for almost nine months to one year. Okay, sir. So the last question is, uh, sir, the cautions to be taken while examining a case of diagnosed Wegener's granulomatosis and if there's any uh, possibility of uh, nasal bridge collapse while examination or is that a risk yeah exactly there is a possibility of nasal bridge collapse and uh, uh, so whenever you you are seeing a patient of bilateral nasal, nasal lacrimal duct obstruction because most of this patient will have bilateral nldo so you know be cautious while doing a uh, 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 row plus and then it's a good idea to get an imaging or CT scan done to look for the structure of the, you know, uh, bony frame from around the nose. Because this, this cartilage and all around uh, the nose, the bones, you know, they uh, undergo necrosis, you know, in, in Wegener. They are very big. So there is a possibility patient, this patient also develops saddle nose deformity and uh, chances of failure of this year are quite high. So it's right, yeah, there, there's a possibility of collapse. Okay, sir. And just one more question. What is the frequency of intracanalicular antibiotic loading which you had shown us? Uh, how frequently do we have to repeat it? Yeah, so uh, I repeat it every three days. So suppose I have given on day one, I call the patient on day three. But then <clears throat> there cannot be any strict protocol because many of these patients, you know, out, are outstation patients can come on day three but a patient from bihar up bangladesh sometimes you know so, so if they are ready to stay fine otherwise sometimes i also call them on a weekly basis and it gets results in two to three uh, two to three injections <clears throat> yes, sir. thank you sir for uh, such an extensive coverage of the topic that is all with the questions at hand
Okay. Thank you for answering each of them so clearly. Okay. Thanks, Tithi. Thanks, Subhav. Thanks, Ruju. Thank you so much, sir. I'll just yeah. like to make an announcement about yeah. our next uh, uh, topic, which will be covered on 9th of November by Dr. Santosh Shonavar. He will be speaking on the concepts and techniques of enucleation and evisceration.